I'm going to talk about two different pieces of work, so my talk's in two parts, and that's the color coding of my co-authors. So the first part is joint with uh, Demetrius Giannakis, Ben Littner, Max Pike, and Joanna Slowinska, and the second part is joint with Peter Koltai. So uh, what pulls these two together is they are both means of extracting or discovering dynamics from data. And the first is about cycle extraction. And by that I mean you want to, from your data, extract the periods and the phase patterns in state space from uh, particularly long-lived cycles in your, in your data or your dynamics. And the specific example I'm going to spend a lot of time on is the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, pattern. And we're going to extract this from sea surface temperature images. And then in the second part, I'm going to, I guess, generalize this uh, in the sense that instead of talking about periodic motion or cycles, I'll talk about aperiodic, but still persistent and long-lived patterns. And uh, so uh, that is mainly talking about uh, fluid flow that I'll get onto, or very briefly, or you can ask me, networks toward the end. Uh, so uh, I'll describe a framework to tell you where these persistent uh, acyclic features are, when they appear, when they disappear. And um, if you want a network version of this, you can think of time evolving complex networks where clusters might emerge, live for some time, and then vanish. So how do you find those? All right, so part one. Uh, this is a map of sea surface temperature on 1st of September 2020. And of course, there's a strong latitudinal correlation. So you have warm water, the red, near the equator, and you have cooler blue water near the poles. And uh, well, for the most part, that's what goes on. But you get these uh, anomalies, like this yellow tongue here. And uh, that's indicative of cooler than expected water. And what people normally do because of this high correlation is they subtract the long-term mean or the climatological mean. So then you have maps of sea surface temperature anomalies. And this is for the same period, just the week prior to what I showed you. And that yellow tongue is, uh, you see here now, a blue and uh, cooler than average water. And uh, this is indicative of a La Nina um, uh, phase. So uh, ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, is an approximate oscillation between two extremes. So at the one extreme, you have this cooler tongue of water in the Indo-Pacific on the surface. And at least for Australia, for the East Coast, that means cooler, wetter conditions. And in the last 12 months, we've had quite a few severe floods. And that has been, uh, well, maybe not totally due to La Nina, but La Nina has had a big impact on those floods. And at the other extreme, you have warm water on the surface. And this is indicative of El Nino. And for the East Coast of Australia, this means warmer, drier conditions. And if the El Nino is strong, drought. Uh, we've had La Nina, well, maybe I mentioned this on the next slide. So uh, the, the standard way of assessing uh, El Nino, La Nina status is you, uh, you put one of these boxes in the Indo-Pacific. So these are carefully chosen. These are placed about where I showed you that uh, blue or yellow tongue of water. So it's where you expect the oscillation to occur. And so for comparison with what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll work with this 3-4 box, which is a combination of the Nino 3 and the Nino 4 box. And so what you do is every day you spatially average all the anomaly values in this rectangle, and you get a number, and you record the number. And then you make a time series, like over here. So this is the last 70 years from 1950 to 2020. And on the y-axis, you record this anomaly. So zero would be right at the climatological mean. Uh, up is uh, your warmer, and down is your, your cooler. And you can see there is kind of an oscillation there. And the approximate uh, cycle period is about four years. If I zoom in toward the more recent time, like here, uh, this is from 2017 to 2021, you see that, well, uh, you, you don't exactly get a sine wave, uh, but there is some up and down. And uh, in fact, it's not uh, really uh, a complete cycle because you can get La Nina's uh, one, two, and even three years in a row. And, and right now, as an example of that, I think many countries around the world have called now uh, the upcoming, um, I guess, uh, uh, for you guys, it would be uh, winter, the upcoming winter, our summer, 
uh, La Nina. Okay, Australia is not called it yet because we are still working on, we haven't, uh, the, our Bureau of Meteorology has not put in yet the, um, the, the, the updates that the temperature is warming. So our threshold is a little uh, higher than, than other countries. Okay, so our goals are to extract a canonical strong ENSO cycle. So what, is, what does an ENSO cycle look like? This is not really uh, um, agreed upon. And we want to do this in the first instance directly from sea surface temperature fields. Uh, I won't have too much to say about this because of time, but the cycle we extract, it is a cycle in the sense that you proceed around a circle at a constant rate. So we call this rectifying, and uh, this ends up revealing more detail on the formation of El Nino, so the La Nina to El Nino formation. One thing I will talk about is a better self-consistency in terms of periodicity and cyclicity compared to the Nino 3-4 index. And because of these items and some other things I'll discuss, uh, we argue that our characterization is improved over just using a scalar like Nino 3-4. Okay, so the next couple of slides are uh, math. And I, I don't know, I tried to, because of this disparate group of people, uh, walk some middle road with some math and some non-math, and maybe I end up pleasing no one, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's see. So. Uh, my, my phase space I'll call omega. Mu is an invariant probability measure that some other people, Tiago and Matteo, have mentioned already. And uh, phi is our dynamical system. So um, you might think of this in the climate case as omega is the set of all climate configurations. That's very complicated. And uh, phi might be uh, an update every month of the climate configuration. Now from this, I'm going to build a transfer operator, which we've also heard about yesterday, so that is nice. Uh, and this is just simply uh, composing some complex valued function f with uh, the inverse of our dynamics. So it's just a push forward, it's the natural push forward under the dynamics of some complex valued function. And it's linear and it's obviously a composition operator. So let's see how this works, um, what its spectrum and its eigenfunctions look like for the simplest possible dynamical system with a cycle, namely the phase space is a circle and the dynamics is a rigid rotation by angle alpha. So that is my dynamics. And what you can show in that case is that this operator has eigenvalues lambda k given by e to the i k alpha, k integer. And the corresponding eigenfunctions are g k theta. So theta is my state parameterizing my phase space, the circle. And again, k is an integer. Now, if I take the first eigenvalue, so k is 1, uh, okay, by the formula, this is e to the i alpha. But uh, now my point is, suppose you didn't know what the dynamics was. Suppose you didn't know the alpha, but you, did, you were somehow from data able to compute your transfer operator, and you were able to find lambda 1. Then you could back out from the argument of lambda 1 what alpha is. So this is roughly the strategy we're going to take. Uh, further, in this case, everything is extremely nice because the, the corresponding eigenfunction g1 is, if you just plug in 1 here, you get e to the i theta. And, uh, well, as you run theta from 0 to 2 pi, e to the i theta traces out a circle in the complex plane. And so you have a conjugacy between your geometric circle, your, your phase space, and uh, the range of the complex eigenfunction in the complex plane both rotations by alpha. Here, by the, the action is multiplication by the eigenvalue. So that's nice, but maybe not so uh, practical. So uh, let me describe a useful generalization of this. And I'm going to show you two non-trivial examples. So the first is the Lorentz system. So there my, my omega is the Lorentz attractor, and my phi would be a time t map of my flow. And the second is something I've already mentioned, omega, this is for Enzo, omega is my set of climate configurations, and uh, phi is uh, a monthly update when we make our observation. Okay, so uh, now the generalization. So if I have more complicated dynamics like this, like these guys here, uh, I can compute, well, I can estimate eigenfunctions of my transfer operator. And uh, suppose I have one, g, so that is a mapping from omega, my phase space, which is very big and large, down to the complex plane. 
And you can think of this as a projection or, in fact, a, a semi-conjugacy of the original dynamics. Maybe I put up the conjugacy, conjugacy, conjugacy diagram. So up here we have our complicated dynamics. And what G is doing is factoring, pushing you down onto the complex plane, pushing you down onto a particular cycle, the cycle corresponding to G and its eigenvalue. So uh, if I choose now uh, some lambda on, on my unit circle, which is where all the lambda live, then this down the bottom, this is just the system where you multiply by, by lambda. And up top, well, um, uh, that's, that's, that's the real dynamics. So this, this projection down, that is the extraction method. That, that is, you have done the extraction. Let me show you, well, actually, I, I'm in two minds whether to show you this slide. So I have a slide on the numerics, how I actually do it. I guess for some people this might be useful, so let me quickly go through this. So suppose you have data points. How do you actually estimate your transfer operator? So we use what I'm presenting here is an extremely simple method. Suppose you have a data trajectory, xi, and what we do is around each data point, you make a Gaussian kernel of some diameter, some small diameter. And then we create an n by n, n is the number of, n is the length of your trajectory, an n by n matrix uh, simply by collocating your, your uh, kernel. So you should think of Pij as the conditional probability that data point j goes to data point i. Because if you advance j by 1, that would give you xj plus 1. And if that is nearby xi, then this kernel would have high value. So um, that is it. And then the denominator is just a normalization to make sure the column is summed to 1. So I'm making a Markov transition matrix. It's non-negative. All the eigenvalues have to be inside the unit circle. And we're going to look at the, the non-trivial eigenvalues of this matrix that have the greatest magnitude. So I'm already, this is an approximation. So already I'm not going to have all eigenvalues on the unit circle as I should. So I look at the one that is closest to the unit circle because this will represent greatest persistence of my cycle, with the most long lived cycle. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so here is how it works with uh, not a toy example, but uh, at least something not from real data. So we have a, a trajectory of length 160 generated by the Lorentz equations, sampled uh, pretty finely, 0.01 time units. And um, so this is 16,000 data points. And so I build a 16,000 by 16,000 transition matrix, and I compute its eigenvalues. And I take the one with the largest magnitude. There will be one that has eigenvalue 1, so I ignore that. I look at the next one. And this is, this is what we get. So it's not exactly magnitude one, but it's pretty close. To get the, the period, I should look at uh, this quantity here. So every step I advance this fraction, of, this fraction of my circle. And so one over that will be how many time steps I need to complete a journey around my circle. And so that's uh, 77 time steps. A time step was 0.01, so my cycle length is 0.77 in real Lorentz time. Let's have a look at the corresponding eigenfunction. So my eigenvector, which is approximating my eigenfunction, has length 16,000. And it's ordered along the trajectory. So, and each entry is a complex number. So what I'm plotting on the left here is those 16,000 complex numbers joined up by lines. And you go along the trajectory around and around my unit circle. So this is the projection onto the complex plane. This is the unit circle I was talking about. Uh, this is the real part, just to show you that it's uh, roughly simple harmonic motion. I mean, you can kind of see that already from this. And this is showing you what is going on in phase space. So now, here we are not in high dimensions. We, we have three dimensions. We can visualize everything. We know exactly what the state is. I'm really observing the full state. And so, uh, there are 16,000 points here. Each one uh, I color according to the phase around this circle. 
And you can see that uh, now you can see what is going on. The cycle that we are picking up is this dominant cycle around the wings of the Lorentz attractor. And Lorentz is symmetric, if, for those familiar with the equations, and uh, we correctly pick up this symmetry. We don't get two separate eigenvalues, we get one eigenvalue, and that is for this symmetric shared uh, cycle length. Uh, so I'll show you a movie to show you that this is really what's uh, wrong movie, wrong movie, this one. So what I'm doing here is I, I start with the picture I just showed you. I color all the points with paint and then I don't, they don't get repainted. But in the movie, I just advance each frame by pushing forward along my trajectory one step. And then I do that 77 times around the cycle. There are 77 frames in the movie. And you see that uh, you get this dominant cyclic motion around the Lorentz wings. Yes, Eric. Is, is the paint simply identifying initial conditions, or is that a measured quantity or something? Uh, I mean, there's, there's an arbitrariness to the, phase, the total phase that you do the painting with, but once you've fixed the phase for everything, then it's fixed. Oh, it's just helping us follow the trajectories. Sorry? It's just helping us follow the trajectories. Uh, yeah. With our eye, yeah. Yeah, with your eye, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so now uh, back to Enzo. Uh, so we want to do basically the same thing. Uh, now the data we have are these images of sea surface temperature anomalies. So each one of those is, uh, so they're on a two by two degree grid. So each one of those has about 5,000 pixels. So you could think of that as a, you're, you're in R 4,868. So it's high dimensional. Um, and the data we're using is from 50 years from 1970 to 2020, sampled monthly. So in total, we have 12 by uh, 50 is 600 data points. Now, uh, we don't know the state of the climate system. We just know this observation. So to help me find the cycle, I'm going to do something pretty standard from uh, classical uh, uh, nonlinear um, time series analysis which is I'm going to embed, Tarkin's embed just one uh, lag, one quarter of the expected cycle. So we expect the cycle to be around about four years, 48 months. So I will put in one lag of 12 months. So this is not going to learn me the, the whole climate state, but it, I hope, will be enough for me to see where I am in the Enzo cycle. Otherwise, if I just use one observation, I don't know if I'm going up or coming down. I need some other information. So the, when I build my, my transition matrix, which is going to be about 600 by 600, because I only have 600 data points, uh, the, I'm going to be working in R2D, so about 9,700 and something. Okay, so I use the, the Gaussian kernels I talked about before. I get this 600 by 600 matrix. I compute the, the leading uh, eigenvalue, and I back out a cycle length, and that comes to 47 months, which is pretty close to the 48, which is only an estimate anyway. And um, now for the eigenvector, uh, the, what I'm showing, let's look at these first. So these plots are analogous to what I had before for Lorentz. They're analogous to this. So previously, I had 16,000 data points, low dimensions, no errors. I got a lovely unit circle. Now I have 600 data points, high dimensions, and obs real observations. So there's some noise. And I, of course, I don't get exactly uh, a lovely unit circle, uh, but I get something that looks kind of circular. Now I've restricted the data here to the, the, the parts of the, the, the values of the eigenvector that are toward the periphery, so large magnitude, because these are the ones that represent strong uh, parts of the Enzo cycle. These ones in here, in, toward the middle, that are grayed out, they represent uh, kind of neutral conditions. Uh, now, climatologists, what they uh, typically do with Enzo these days is break it up into eight phases of six months each. So that is what we've done here. We have eight equiangular phases colored differently around the cycle. And what should happen is, if this is really behaving in a cyclic, self-consistent way, if I advance six months, then this group of dark green points should advance onto the gray, I guess, oops, the gray points uh, here, maybe I'll just point. 
the gray points here. And indeed, they do. So this is just advancing along the time series six months. Each one of these points, I know exactly where it goes because I have a time series. So they go there, that's, that's good. If I advance again, they should go to the, these red, and they do pretty much. If I advance again, they should go on the green, and they do pretty much. And I can go again, and they uh, move nicely as a group, uh, phase to phase, approximately. So that is nice. Uh, if I try to do the same thing with Nino 3.4, then, um, so again, what I've done here is lag by uh, 11 months. That turned out to be a little better for Nino than 12 months. Uh, and then I advance like this, advance the phases, they, they kind of go all over the place. So the Nino 3, 4, this simply scalar value, this is not uh, so self-consistent as a cycle. And, um, well, I think one of the things that might be going wrong with predictability of Enzo, at least from the Nino 3, 4 point of view, is that you're, fa you're simply uh, categorizing the current uh, state in the wrong phase. And if you categorize it in the correct phase, it may be more predictable. Um, I think I just look at these images here and I'll tell you now how I get them. So what we do to get those is at each one of these data points, you have a complete image of SSTA. And so what I do is I average these, all the SSTA images corresponding to these dark green dots and I get a composite SSTA image. So I do that for all of the phases, and I get my eight sea surface temperature anomaly images. So I would start, for example, with mature El Nino, so you have a strong red band here, and then you proceed around in this direction. So this gets a little uh, cooler, then it's switched really to cooler than average water. By this stage, you're pretty much mature La Nina. Then you start to warm up a bit, warm up, now you're neutral, warmer than average, and now you're back to mature El Nino. So this is our, this is our, character, our composite characterization of the eight phases of a canonical strong Enzo cycle. All right, so this is my last slide. So uh, this, this idea of constructing a transfer operator from your data, which you can also do in high dimensions using these kernel ideas, uh, is um, a nice way to extract persistent cycles from your, from your data. And um, I hope I convinced you, at least with the Lorentz and SST observations. Um, I showed you that uh, our phases are much more cyclic than those based on the Nino 3-4 index, and I discussed a bit why um, that can lead to greater predictability if you phase them correctly. Um, yeah, okay, we have this rectification, so the the Nino 3.4 is really, uh, as you go around the cycle, it is going in real time. But we distort real time in order to give you a constant flow rate around your cycle, which is the rectification. And this is convenient because it expands the La Nina to El Nino buildup, and you get more phases. Uh, you get five phases there instead of four. So uh, that is another advantage of what we're doing. And all of our phases were built on sea surface temperature. But of course, you have other observations. You have fields of air pressure, um, wind speed direction, surface air temperature, precipitation. So what you can do is go back and say, well, uh, if I make a composite image from the phases you built from temperature, if I, if I do that for precipitation, say, does the precipitation behave as it should for an ENSO cycle? And we check this, and indeed, they do all check out, and they're very much uh, following what you would expect from an ENSO cycle. So, for all of the above reasons, we believe that our Enzo cycle is certainly an improvement over the Nino 3.4 uh, way of categorizing El Nino. Okay, so that was, um, oh, and this came out last year in Nature Communications. So that was um, cycles. And so now I want to talk about uh, possibly acyclic but persistent behavior. So here is a uh, why is that stopped? Here is a uh, flow, uh, sea surface flow in the North Atlantic. This is derived from satellite altimetry data. Just to orient you, uh, New York is here. This is um, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. This is an eddy rich region. There are lots of uh, mesoscale ocean eddies, like these red objects here. 
And they are example, they're just one example of uh, coherent, persistent, long-lived behavior that is different from the complex, chaotic, turbulent background flow. So each of these red objects, again, I'm painting the particles at the beginning of the movie and the paint doesn't change. So you have really the same water getting carried around in these eddies. They're good transporters of heat and salt and carbon and so forth. And uh, this is a 90 day movie, so these objects are lasting for 90 days. Toward the end of the talk, I'm going to discuss uh, what happens if you have uh, objects that are coherent, but just for some of the time. So maybe a period less than 90 days here. Uh, okay. Right, so you can think of these, I mean, you can use these in various ways, maybe as uh, a way of uh, model reduction. So these are the more predictable components of your dynamical system. So you might want to uh, capture those components, model them well, and then the rest you could model perhaps as noise or stochastic or something like that. Um, you can think of them as uh, a more predictable backbone or skeleton of your otherwise turbulent dynamics. So if these last for the whole flow time, like the 90 days with the eddies, then there are methods that, uh, including transfer operator methods and these uh, dynamic Laplace methods that I'll talk about for finding where they are. For example, that is what I used, uh, the, the, the transfer operator approach is what I used to find these red coherent sets here. So my, my, my setup is I have some uh, velocity field that is um, time dependent. Everything here is time dependent, so not, not autonomous. And I'm going to assume just for uh, keeping the formulae simple that it's divergence free, so I can eliminate any density uh, components. And my phase space I'll call M, so this is some full dimensional manifold connected compact embedded in RD. And phi T is my flow map, so this is going to advance T units of time uh, a, a particle. I have a particle at time zero, nominal time zero, and I advance it with my nonlinear dynamics by phi T. Okay, now uh, how do you find these coherent sets? So, now I'm not, I'm not so sure how this slide is going to go. Um, this is, I tried to give some intuition that might appeal to a broad number of people. Uh, so, in, in differential geometry, there's, uh, people, there's a field called isoparametric theory where people are interested in uh, sets that have small boundary relative to enclosed volume. So think of things like disks, spheres, right? Or, generally round objects have small boundary compared to their volume. And uh, yeah, parallel to this, they, they look at Laplace operators on manifolds and the, eigen function, the, the dominant eigenfunctions of those Laplace operators. And what they find is that uh, the eigenfunctions tend to localize or have large values on poorly connected regions of the manifold. So here is a very simple example. I just have a flat 2D manifold. It's a large disk with four small disks stuck on the, on the periphery. And um, the first one is, uh, this is meant to be constant. Um, it is, it's just the, the scale is very narrow by construction. And then the next, uh, you see there is this localization effect, strong negative, strong positive values on the small disks. And there are a couple of ways of thinking about why this is the case. One is um, if you want to disconnect your manifold with a cut, then it's very cheap to cut, to snip there and cut it away. That is one reason. Uh, or if you think of Laplace as generating a heat flow, if you initialize a lot of heat here, it takes a long time for the heat to get through the neck, the narrow neck, to equilibrate through the rest of the manifold. Okay, so these, these are intuitive reasons why uh, you get this localization effect. And what we're going to do is extend these ideas to the case where you don't just have a manifold sitting there, but it's getting evolved by nonlinear dynamics, which is the situation we're in. So then what you have is a dynamic Laplace operator that I'll show you on the next slide. And the, uh, the sets you're looking for, they don't just have small boundary to volume ratio, but they have small evolving boundary to volume ratio. So if I go back to this slide, you see the, the, the big difference between the, the red sets and the blue sets is initially they're all like disks. They all have small boundary to area. But as I run, 
the ones that aren't red get a really long boundary really quickly. But the red ones maintain a small boundary. So this is the dynamic version of what is going on in the, the static case, the small boundary to uh, volume property. OK, so um, a little bit of math here just to show you the object I'm working with. So the dynamic Laplacian, this d for dynamic, is defined like this. So think of this as acting on some real valued function. Uh, so what you do is first you apply inverse of phi t. So this is the transfer operator again, we're, we're area preserving. This is your push forward, you take the function, you push it forward to time t. Then what you do is you apply Laplace on that evolved manifold. So the Laplace feels the geometry, the distortion that you incurred from the nonlinear push forward. And then you pull it back with phi t. So you take it back to a function on the original manifold at time zero. Uh, the alternative way of thinking about this is, uh, so there's a lemma in differential geometry that says this is the same as, this integrand is the same as Laplace uh, Euclidean, this is Laplace with respect to Euclidean, Euclidean uh, pulled back by phi t. So you take your metric, Euclidean metric, you pull it back with phi t. And I'm going to call that uh, gt for short. So um, you can see now that what we're really doing here is averaging different Laplace Beltrami operators on the same manifold, but we're changing the metric in time. And for people in dynamical systems, uh, this has a very familiar representation in coordinates. It's the Cauchy-Green tensor that you would get so from uh, linearizing your, uh, your flow map. And we're going to compute eigen uh, functions of this Laplacian to get the coherent sets. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, this is rayleigh Bernard convection. You've got a, a thin slab of fluid, um, 16 by 16 by 1. You heat it from below, so th the, the fluid is rising. It hits the ceiling where you refrigerate, and it cools down, gets denser, falls. And so you have this turbulent motion rising and falling. And uh, what people observe is, although it's turbulent, there are columnar structures in there that persist for some time, and, and these have been coined turbulent superstructures. So they're not always there, but they last for a relatively long time. Uh, what I'm going to look at is the time it takes to, for particles to, on average, rise and fall five times. So we want to find these as, as coherent sets because, well, they are acyclic persistent structures, so we should be able to do that. Well, I'm just skipping to the results now. So what I did is on this, on this dynamical system, on this manifold, I computed an estimate of the dynamic Laplacian, which I can tell you about how I did that later if you're interested. And here are the leading, looking from above, the leading 17 eigenfunctions. Um, why 17? Because there was a relatively large gap between the 17th and the 18th, so we truncate there. And, okay, looking at this, in this color map, a pink and red correspond to extreme values. So if you can think back to the localization I was talking about, we should be able to look at this and see where these superstructures are from the pink and the red. But the problem is that um, the, the eigenspace is correct, but these structures are mixed up uh, in the basis vectors that you find here. So we need to unmix to get individual structures. And so let me tell you how we unmix. Uh, so these, the, the input is, um, what, what we're going to look for is a sparse basis. I want uh, basically, uh, th these are spanning some subspace, 17 dimensional subspace, and I want to find a sparse basis for this subspace. That's the idea. And each sparse basis vector is going to be supported on one feature. And so I have 17 vectors, I get 17 features. So uh, I start with the U1 to U17. Uh, the P here is how many... Uh, uh, pixels or trajectories you used in each picture. And uh, I want to rotate these vectors, these 17 vectors, onto a sparse set of 17 vectors. So how I'm going to do this is um, I stack up the, the vectors as columns. I make, so I have a 17 column array. I, I want a sparse array of the same size. And what I want to be able to do is rotate with a 17 by 17 rotation matrix, I want to be able to rotate this sparse array back onto the original data array. And if I can do that well, 
this Frobenius norm is small, and I want to minimize this. And at the same time, I want, this is my sparsity inducing term, so I, it's some L1 norm on the array. Now this is non-convex, it's hard to find a global optimum, but what you can do is very easily find an exact local optimum, because if you fix R and solve for S, then this is solved exactly by a soft thresholding, so that's, that's immediate. And if you fix the S and you solve for R, then this is given by a compact SVD, which is also very fast because R is typically much smaller than P. So by alternating these two, uh, and, then, uh, and then you eventually converge, you know that you have an exact local optimum. And what we find in practice is this local optimum is typically the, the global one that you want. So this is called sparse eigenbasis approximation. What is the uh, compact SVD? Uh, it's just, uh, it's like SVD, but you don't want, uh, you don't want everything, you just want the top uh, 17 in this case. Uh, you, uh, maybe I'll try, attempt to write something on the board. Uh, no, it's okay, you can't explain that. <laughs> yeah. So in MATLAB, you would, uh, you would do SVD uh, array comma zero, and you'll get a compact oh, okay. SVD. Yeah. So it's fairly standard. Yeah. Oh, someone like my answer, okay. <laughs> Uh, so here are the results. Okay, so uh, what we do is we take uh, these seventeen. Whoops, we take these seventeen vectors, and we run uh, the algorithm to find the sparse basis. And this is your this is your sparse basis. Okay. Uh, nicely, you have this uh, geometrically local uh, support. Of course, that's not coming from SIBA because uh, this is just an algebraic algorithm. So this is really the geometry is really encoded in the eigenfunctions. It's just it's not so clear. You have to reveal it through this. Uh, New basis. Um, yeah, if you want this code, it's on my web page or this GitHub site. And you can now put them all together. So if you want, you can just uh, add them up, superimpose them to get a single picture of your 17 superstructures. So let's see that this is actually behaving in the way we would like it to. This one. Okay, so on the left, it's the same red here. And I'm evolving, again, I just paint them a color at the beginning, and then I evolve according to the five uh, rise and fall times. And you see that uh, the, five, the, the, the 17 red sets tend to uh, hang together and not disperse. On the right, I just picked some arbitrary patterns. So I got some vertical stripes, and then I evolved. So this is just to demonstrate that you really have a turbulent flow, but if you uh, look carefully and choose wisely which parts of the phase space you want to look at, you can actually find structure in there that is long-lived, okay, despite the, the turbulence. Okay, so the, um, I'm not sure how I'm going for time, um, do you know roughly? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, oh, perfect, that's more than enough. Um, Okay, so this last part is now um, what happens when these objects, these persistent objects, are not always there. Uh, usually this is the case, actually. So if you think of the ocean eddy example, eddies can last from as little as uh, a month to up to three years. And I showed you an experiment where I did a computation for 90 days or three months, and I found the eddies that lasted for three months but I did not find, would not find the eddies that lasted two months or one month because that's not how the, it works. Uh, similarly with the superstructures, I had to carefully choose my time. This is a kind of a drawback of all these Lagrangian coherent structure methods. You have to pick a time window and then you just find what is in the time window. So I want to get away from that. With the, with the superstructures, I chose five uh, free fall times because that was a reasonable time that these structures are persisting for. So, uh, but if you have many, many objects that are coming and going, how do you find when they're coming and going and what they do while they're there? So you can, uh, you can try to repeat basically what I did, but uh, with uh, many windows of different time windows of different locations and different sizes and try to piece together the results. But what we want to do is just a single computation on a big window and get the information from that. Okay, 
So that is what we're going to do. Uh, I think I might, I, this is a bit of math. I, I can come back to this if people would like more detail, but I think I'm just going to go on. So the strategy we have is, okay, let's recall that this dynamic Laplacian, that was an operator on the phase space, effectively on the phase space at time zero. Now what we're going to do is time expand our manifold in the kind of standard way. So you, you take the Cartesian product with time. And now I need an operator on this time expanded phase space. And when we built this dynamic Laplacian, remember I had the pullback matrix GT. And I, I averaged the Laplace Beltrami operators with respect to GT over T. Now I time expanded. So an obvious thing to do, which is what we do, is to take Laplace GT and we apply it specifically to the teeth copy of M, i.e. to the teeth, the time fiber, which is a copy of space. And we do that for all the time fibers. But then in order to connect them, we need to have some temporal diffusion. So we have a one dimensional diffusion in time. And um, that is going to have some parameter that tells us how strongly they are connected. So in sum, we have uh, this, this Laplace Beltrami operator on the augmented space, on the time expanded space, Laplace capital G. And what happens is on the teeth time fiber, you apply in space on that fiber, Laplace GT. And then in time, you just do a one dimensional Laplace, which is twice differentiation with respect to time with strength A squared. So A is some scalar, it's just a strength parameter. Now we call this the inflated dynamic Laplace operator because we're not averaging anymore. We've now blown it up, inflated it to give each copy of phase space its own, um, its own uh, fiber. Okay, so uh, these constructions and connections with, uh, with the differential geometric aspects we've written up and this is going to come out in communications on pure and applied math later this year, hopefully. And uh, yeah, we have uh, several results in there. I just show you one about the spectrum. So this is connecting the spectrum of the dynamic Laplacian that I'll call small lambda with the spectrum for this inflated version that I call large lambda. Uh, so first, so all these are negative, all, all these are negative numbers. So first up, uh, what you have is that these inflated eigenvalues, they're always less negative than the dynamic ones. And that's, uh, yeah, maybe this is not so easy to, to see, uh, but uh, this is, I'm, I'm saying this is due to more mixing experienced by the dynamic version. If you take the inflated one and you increase A, you tie the, the time fibers together more tightly, then this leads to more mixing. There is less, uh, this greater temporal connectivity doesn't let the different fibers adapt individually so much and this tends to make the eigenvalues more negative. And if you send A all the way to infinity, so you tie all the fibers together infinitely tightly, it forces them to be all the same, and you essentially recover the dynamic Laplacian. And uh, the, the eigenspectrum we can prove uh, converges in this way. So A is really a tuning parameter. When at one extreme, when A is zero, you don't tie the time fibers together at all. They just can do their own thing. And at the other extreme, when you tie them together infinitely tightly, there is no variation whatsoever, and you may as well just have done your dynamic Laplacian. Okay, but we practically we want something in between. Because we want to see change. We want to see that there might be not a coherent set, then there is one, and then maybe later there is not. There has to be some change. So we that's why we have this relaxation of this materiality property. Okay, so I'm going to end with this example. Uh, here is a flow on a torus. Our data are these 400 trajectories. And there are, there's coherence for, maybe you can see it with your eye, I don't know. Um, there's coherence for uh, two time intervals. And in two other time intervals, we're completely mixing. And we would like to find this and find what the coherent sets are. And, no. and we're going to do this automatically from the eigenfunctions of this uh, inflated dynamic Laplacian. So here are the leading eight eigenfunctions. Again, there's a spectral gap after eight, that is why I'm choosing eight. Uh, so 
you can see from the this localization structure that it looks like you have this checkerboard pattern, two by two pattern of coherent sets. And um, when are they around? So what you do is you plot the norm of the eigenfunction on a particular time fiber. So time is going from zero to four. And then you take at each time here, you take your time slice through your eigenfunction. So that's a copy of space and you take the spatial norm. And when that norm is high, you are coherent. So here you see you have four blue curves. They are high initially, then they drop down and they're zero. And then you have another four, these reddish ones that are zero, then they go, the norm goes up, comes down and zero. So you look at this and you say, okay, I have four coherent sets here, then none, then four, then none. And if you take, if you take these, uh, these, eigen these eight eigenfunctions in space-time, I'm just showing you a slice here, these exist in space-time, and you throw these space-time functions into SIBA to get sparse vectors, and then you put them all together in the same picture like I did with the 17 really banal structures, then you get a picture like this. So this is time, and, what you, and this is x and y, and what you see is initial, as you proceed through time, you have four sets, they get smaller and go away, and in this period here you have nothing. Then you get another four, they, they are small, they grow, they shrink, go away, and then you have nothing. And on the next slide, what I'm going to do is pass, I have a movie where I pass through in time like this. Okay, so maybe look at the trajectory version. So initially you have coherence, then you mix, and the color goes away, and then they, the, you come back to this coherent regime, and then at some point you're going to mix, and you, the color goes to zero, and there's no coherence. Now, when you come back, okay, there are your four rotational structures. There you, you start to mix. And when you come back the second time, the particles up here, in, say, in the top left, they're not the same as were in the top left to begin with because you completely mix the fluid. So there's no uh, requirement that it has to be the same fluid that comes back into the same structure. You can have completely different fluid. This doesn't matter. All right. Um, so that... This is my last slide. Okay, so what did I, what did I say? So if, if you have uh, coherent uh, sets that are present the whole time, then you can use the dynamic Laplacian to find these. And I didn't talk about numerics, but uh, what we used was there are various ways you can compute these things, diffusion maps, uh, finite elements, that's what I used here. This works very nicely with sparse data. There is code and examples uh, here. When you have lots of coherent sets, then SIBA is very handy for disentangling them. And actually, I recommend SIBA as a general post-processing step for spectral clustering as a, as a, as a general statement. Um, when you do spectral clustering, you get uh, eigenvectors. And then people use things like k-means to, uh, to get the actual clusters from the eigenvectors. But this means you have to assign every data point to a cluster. And often, you don't want to do that. And uh, SIBA is very nice because it will kill any data point that is not obviously in a cluster. Okay, and then the, the last thing I showed is um, when you have coherent sets emerging and vanishing, then this inflated construction can detect when that is happening and what they do while they live. And uh, well, so we have all this theory now in this paper and we have some preliminary examples like the one I showed you and what we're working on now is uh, specializing these and extending them so we can work with real geophysical flows high dimensional things and also time varying networks. The same kind of principles apply to time varying networks. And well, actually, since there are many network people here, I'd be happy to, or, or, or applicate or brain people, uh, be happy to hear about problems where you want to think about uh, structures that are emerging, uh, living for a while and then disappearing because uh, this is what we designed this uh, technology for. Thanks very much. <laughs>